Welcome all to uh, today's uh, uh, academic daily roundup. Uh, so this is the, uh, the session where we more informally look back at the different activities that took place at the World Investment Forum um, and where we, we take an academic lens to, to look at what, what research says about some of these topics, um, uh, what area requires some deeper thinking uh, and why all this matters for uh, policy. So um, I'm, I'm delighted to say that today I'm, I'm joined with uh, uh, two leading scholars in the field of international business, uh, uh, Lorraine Eden and Sariana Lundam. And so let, let me just uh, briefly introduce uh, uh, both of them, and it will be brief because they have very, very um, uh, long CV. So Lorraine Eden is Professor Emerita of Management uh, and also has a joint appointment uh, as Research Professor of Law in the Texas A&M uh, uh, School of Law. Uh, and she has uh, uh, taken on many functions in the past, but among them, she has been editor-in-chief of the Journal of International Business Studies. She has been the president of the Academy of International Business. She is an AIB fellow and also the current dean of the AIB fellows. Uh, and she um, uh, uh, ha uh, is a renowned scholar in many areas related to international business, but uh, uh, especially in issues related to uh, international taxation. Um, we also have Sariana Lundan with us, who holds the Chair in International Management and Governance at the University of Bremen in Germany. Uh, so she's a fellow uh, um, of both the Academy of International Business and the European International Business Association. Um, and she's also the first editor in chief of the Journal of International uh, Business uh, Policy. So, so um, uh, welcome both of you to this uh, uh, panel. Um, so what we'll do is we'll first let them give them uh, their remarks. Uh, in the meantime, if you have any questions or comments, uh, uh, we will uh, get to see them and we will uh, incorporate uh, this into the session as well. So you can start um, uh, ticking them away on the, uh, the platform. Um, Lorraine, I'll, I'll give you the floor. Uh, there. Uh, thank you, Ari. I'm, I'm delighted to be here and delighted to be here with you and Sariana to talk about the World Investment Forum and what's been going on at WIF 2021. Um, I want to spend my time before we engage in the dialogue and answer questions, maybe providing what I think of as a, an overview of where we are and why the World Investment Forum is so important. Uh, I want to situate WIF 2021 in the context of what I see as three ongoing shocks to the global economy. First, the natural disaster of the COVID-19 pandemic and the government responses that together basically created a huge demand and supply shock to the global economy from which we are not recovered. Two, technological uh, shock of the digital revolution the industry 4.0 and scale without mass and the rise of the so-called digital giants. And third, the enormous number of policy changes we've seen in a variety of areas, tax with the United States uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act, uh, UN Tax Committee changes, the OECD, uh, G20 movement on BEPS 1 and BEPS 2, trade changes in particular Brexit, and then the Sustainable Development Goals launched by Young Ted with the 2030 Agenda. If you look back at the last year, compare a year ago to where we are now, what we've seen is double digit declines in foreign direct investment and even larger declines in developing countries. I think we sometimes forget the global economy has just been through a sudden simultaneous interaction of massive supply and demand shocks due to COVID-19. Um, if you look at the most recent World Investment Report released, I believe in June, it shows that global foreign direct investment flows fell by 35% last year from one, one and a half trillion to a trillion dollars. And that was the lowest level, 2020 was the lowest level in 15 years and a drop of 50% from where the level was at its height of two trillion in 2016. If you look at that decline, almost a third of that uh, was due to transactions through the Netherlands, which will come back when I start to talk about tax changes. Uh, Netherlands is one of the largest investment hubs in the world, and much of this was conduit investments. But if you look at greenfield investments, new investments made in developing countries, 
year over year, it fell by 44% last year. Project finance deals fell by 53%, and the combination was basically new equity flows into developing countries fell by more than half. You need Greenfield, you need project finance for developing productive capacity and infrastructure in developing countries, and they fell by half last year. If you look at start looking at sectors, what you see even is that a greenfield and manufacturing went down 75% in Africa, 46% in Latin America and the Caribbean, and 40% in Asia. Worldwide, uh, new investments in manufacturing dropped 41%. You know, the World Investment uh, Report is often very optimistic. <laughs> And the optimism expressed in the report and we hear is that this should bottom out this year, 2021, and start to rise in 2022. That, of course, I think was made on the assumption that there wasn't going to be Delta and all these other variations in COVID that have prolonged the pandemic. And so it looks like our ability to come out of this is going to be very difficult. It, a modest recovery, maybe. And if it's modest, it's in the developed economies, it's not in the developing economies. And so um, it really is a, a difficult issue. If there is gonna be some foreign direct investment, most of it is not gonna to go to the developing economies. And UNCTAD's mission is the developing economies. And that's why one reason why the World Investment Forum is so important now is because of the disaster We've written, this, we've written this since the COVID shock first started. Let me turn a little bit now to talking about foreign direct investment in the main theme of the World Investment Forum this year, which is the SDGs and sustainable development. The World Investment uh, Report does say one of the very few bright spots was that the pandemic increased the demand for digital infrastructure and services. And we know that. I mean, we're here today on Zoom, right? On platforms that really didn't exist two years ago. The demand for this, Teams, and all the others is just ratcheted up. In the one of the very few bright spots and in investments has been project announcements in Greenfield in the ICT industry, which is the backbone of the digital economy. It's the infrastructure on which the digital economy is built is the ICT industry. Fiber optics networks, for example, are one example of when I talk about the ICT, telecommunications investments. We did see, of course, the digital giants benefit, the Facebooks and the Microsofts and the Amazons and the Apples. And really there's been an enormous backlash against them. And that happened much on the tax side too, showing the interaction among these uh, various uh, uh, tsunami, tsunami flows. So what about SDG related investment, renewable energy, digital infrastructure? But clearly what looks like what's happening is these investments overall are down in developing countries and that's going to exacerbate the gap in SDG investments between the developed and the developing is going to make it harder to achieve the sustainable development goals in the developing economies. The World Investment Report tells us SDG related greenfield investments dropped 33% in developing countries, project investment fell 42%, double digit falls from pre COVID levels here. Uh, so, what's going on here? How are multinationals handling that? And I think you know, we, we're international business professors, we study m and and we know that m and are often more resilient here. They react to these shocks better than domestic firms do. They have more opportunities for arbitrage and economies of integration than do domestic firms. And clearly from the multinational perspective, what has mattered is supply chain resilience. There's been a huge focus on restructuring m and &E networks to build in that resilience. We moved from a strategy of mass production to lean production, where we built up enormously long global value chains stretched all over the world based on the idea of just-in-time performance. We could have just-in-time production. And what we saw happening, of course, over the uh, last year from, well, really two years since uh, 2019, is that those very long supply chains don't work. We're getting reshoring, we're getting nearshoring, the supply chains are coming home, the length of these GVCs is getting shortened. The second thing we're seeing multinationals doing is adopting risk management strategies. They're using diversification as a way to spread the risk. 
They're using more supply uh, transparency in supply chains. They're using artificial intelligence, all right, as ways to track what's going on in those supply chains. And, and uh, blockchain, for example, as ways to increase transparency. Um, I had a paper published uh, in the uh, journal International Business Policy with Nirja Srinivasan, who's a partner at NIRA, and she spoke this morning. And she talked about our paper on what we think of as in this terrible time that we're in the middle now, with this incredible in, uh, imperative for multinationals to survive in these changes, we argued there might be a window of opportunity for movement on the SDGs. And we argued not from the view of the digital giants, the born digital multinationals, but from the going digital MNEs, where we argued they already had a big footprint in developing countries, lots of property, plant, and equipment, lots of uh, people working there. And if there were ways to fine tune the policy options to encourage multinationals to in effect revise their CSR, their corporate social responsibility strategies and change those strategies into ones that were more focused on the SDGs, we might get more movement in that area. Um, in other words, brick and mortars are going digital. It is not going to stop. There's an opportunity and a window in those investments to put a little bit of a more twist on the SDGs and we heard about that this morning uh, in the section on SDGs and uh, digital investments. Now, from the developing country perspective, how are you gonna digitalize the economy to attract those investments from those going digital? So they don't just pick up and pull up and leave as they cut their supply chains. And that was a paper Matthew Stevenson talked about today, also in that session where he basically made the argument, we need, uh, developing countries need more digital infrastructure. They need ICT investments and governments in developing countries need to develop a coherent strategy for ICT investments to create that base whereby these firms can partner, the SMEs and small and medium-sized enter enterprises can partner with the large multinationals in these global value chains. Here's a problem though, one of the ways that the developing countries historically have done that is either by being tax havens and having a low rate of corporate income tax or by offering a whole variety of tax preferences such as tax holidays, special economic zones where you had no tax for 10 years or 15 years. But here's another tsunami coming in the window and that's all the changes happening in the tax system brought about by the primarily by the OECD and um, in particular pillar two, which is bringing in a global minimum tax. And that was another, that was a panel I was on today. And that addresses the issue of where are the developing countries going to get the money from in order to do these investments, both to get their way out of the pandemic, two, to start digitalizing the infrastructure in the economy, three, to better prepare their citizens to live in the world that's coming, and four, are there any possible movement on the SDGs, whether that's possible at all? So let me talk a little bit about the G20 proposals coming through. David Bradford presented the Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 proposals, but if you want to listen about Pillar 1, um, I've been talking in a variety of places about Pillar 1, uh, particularly Mount A, which I think is a bad policy that needs to go to the dustpan of history. Uh, but let me talk about Pillar 2, which is a global minimum tax. The idea behind this, and this was signed on to by something like 134 countries and was announced on the 8th of October uh, with the G20. The idea is that there will be a minimum corporate income tax around the world of 15%. So if you're a tax haven and you've been at zero, it's, the minimum is gonna go to 15. Now, if you were at 20 already, you know, you can stay where you are. But let me just explain for a second how that's supposed to work. You, you, I think most people don't pay much attention to international tax. It's a really arcane field and, and very few people, you know, understand how the international tax system works. So let me take a, just two or three minutes and try to give you the bare bones of it. Historically, if you go all the way back to the League of Nations in that wonderful building where UNCTAD is currently located, 
right, in the Palais des Nations. And I'm, some of you, I've been fortunate to be there a few times. It's just a wonderful historic building. That's where the compromise was hammered out on international tax rules. And the rules were set up based on residence countries where the parent firm was and source countries where all the foreign affiliates, the branches and subs were. The proposal and what was adopted at that time was something we call worldwide taxation, which is mean the, the home country levied a tax. Let's say it was a 20% corporate income tax and it taxed the whole firm, not just the parent, but the parent and all its subsidiaries at 20%. So it was called worldwide taxation. And what happened was the source countries got first crack. So a source country getting first crack could say, put its rate at 15 and it would be fully creditable against that 20% rate. Well, that created what um, we think of as an umbrella effect. If the parent country has a 20% umbrella over the top, where should all the host countries have their tax rates? right up underneath, right up underneath that 20% sheltered by that umbrella. And then they can take first crack and get all that revenue. And, you know, when I first started learning about multinationals and foreign direct investment, what we learned about was that one of the things they contributed to the economy was tax base in those host countries. They got huge tax base from the first crack. Well, that thing started to fall apart. And I must say it was led by France. <laughs> frankly, by adopting a territorial system years ago. And over time, what has happened is more and more countries have moved to territorial. Let me tell you what that means. That means if you have American multinational, like uh, um, let's, say, let's say Michelin Tire in France, okay? Michelin Tire is taxed only up to the water's edge of France and any force foreign source income earned around the rest of the world is not taxed. Now, there are some exceptions, what we call fancy the F, uh, 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 CFC rules and rules for passive income, for example. But in general, the system we're on now is a territorial system where nobody taxes outside their border. We just sort of put a ring around the country, say the multinationals taxed in this country, the rest of the world is fair game. And of course, what happened in fair game was a race to the bottom. And the recent estimates of elasticity of investment to tax are 2.5. So it's highly elastic response. And all kinds of tax management problems happened as a result of that. And I've written sort of extensively about these loopholes in the system that created the incentive to race to the bottom and therefore really substantially reduce the revenues raised from corporate income tax. Okay. So along comes the OECD with the BEPS one, base erosion and profit shifting, plugging most of those loopholes, which was a great idea. And a multilateral convention trying to get countries to sign on to plug those loopholes. And in the latest round, there've been this proposals for pillar one and pillar two. And the pillar two one is the one I want to talk about because that's the one that is basically saying, the home country is now saying, sorry, we are not gonna stop at the water's edge anymore we are going to tax you for a minimum of 15. If you don't put a corporate income tax rate on 15%, the home country is going to grab it. I think that offers the possibility designed correctly for actually a real win for developing countries because you know tax havens have set their rates close to zero. You've had all these incentives, these locational tournaments that you know are short term that disappear that lead to what Jagdish Bagwadi called many years ago, directly unproductive investments, dup activities. Come and get the money. When the money's gone, the mobile investment disappears. And, and I will say, uh, you know, I'm born and raised in St. Stephen, New Brunswick, which is one of the poorest regions in, in Canada. And the Canadian government, the whole time I was growing up, did exactly that. It had all kinds of policies designed to encourage firms to move into the maritime provinces. The firms came, got the money. When the money was up, they simply, they simply dried up and disappeared. So this offers an opportunity, Pillar 1, the GLOBE project, if all the major home countries in the world sign on, what I mean is all the major residents, U.S. already has guilty, which is a form of this, but it means the U.K., uh, the Netherlands, Japan, China, all of these countries really have to sign on and agree to this 15%, and they must commit to the first crack goes to the host countries themselves. 
And they then themselves can raise their rates up and get that investment. And then I think that offers the opportunity to do for the developing countries to invest in the productive investments that are needed to make that economy, their economies, A, both catch up with the digitalization uh, that is needed for Industry 4.0, recover from the pandemic and move forward on the SDGs. I also like uh, the pillar two part of this because it works in its principle. It works inside the international tax system. It's something I think the League of Nations and back there in the Palais de Nations in 1930 would have been comfortable with. And, and I, as a you know international tax and transfer pricing expert, also think um, would be comfortable with. And let me just finish up by saying the tax panel I was in on this, which was one that Jeffrey Owens organized, was very important, and I think may end up being one of the most important panels uh, that was uh, at, at the World Investment Forum. It was a panel saying people working on tax need to talk to people in trade and investment. People working on investment, like bilateral investment treaties, need to talk to people in tax who work on bilateral tax treaties and people in trade who work on WTO and um, free trade agreements and customs unions and so on. What, what I think we've had is silos of experts in tax, experts in investments, and experts in um, the SDGs, uh, experts in trade who don't talk to one another and don't understand the basics that cut across and I think what Jeffrey Owens was starting today, uh, he and Michael Leonard, was trying to think about getting the policymakers to recognize you can't just move in one area tax without recognizing it moves in the other areas. And if you want to move uh, on the SDGs, you need to take this into account. And I'll give you one lesson, and I'm going to stop with my one lesson. I moderated the gender and women empowerment and multinationals panel yesterday. And in that, I um, got the opportunity uh, to talk uh, with a woman who is actually the chief economist for what I would have called foreign affairs. It's now called Global Affairs Canada, um, Ms. Paquet, uh, Marie-France Paquet. And what she talked about is how she, through Global Affairs Canada, is negotiating all the various trade agreements to include gender provisions in those agreements. So she was looking at the SDGs, particularly SDG 5. She was looking at the network of trade agreements and saying, I can figure out how to make those come together. And I think that's the way of the future. And that's one of the reasons why I think the World Investment Report, World Investment Forum is so important because it brings people in these different communities together across the disciplines. It also brings academics together with policymakers. And then I'll, I'll make a last plug here for uh, the journal International Business Policy, because that's a journal that gives us all a place to publish in, which is really fantastic. So I'll, I'm going to stop there and I'm happy to answer any questions. So I think that was a very uh, a good segue to uh, go to uh, uh, Sayana, who uh, who really has pioneered the setup of the Journal of International Business Policy. So thank you very much to Lorraine for, for setting out so, uh, so clearly what the main themes were, um, uh, some of the main themes were in today's meeting. Uh, Sariana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so that's great. Uh, Lorraine, of course, um, very pertinent remarks and you pitched it kind of right to me at the end when you said, okay, these things need to, need to come together. Uh, if I start in the morning, um, I, the first session I attended was on SEZs, uh, so special, special economic zones. Uh, we know what they are. They've had a bad reputation for a while. Now they're sort of coming back. Um, but this was very much about SEZ 2.0, uh, so the SEZs for the future. And the first session, unfortunately, suffered from real big con connectivity problems. Uh, so I need to rewatch re the video afterwards. But it was together with you and Habitat. And this was the first time that I heard two things come together, which is urban development uh, and sustainable urban development and SEZs. And what the whole discussion reminded me of uh, is kind of a town and gown um, problematic. 
so Town and Gown, of course, being, you know, fancy universities tend to be located in rather rundown neighborhoods. Uh, and the dynamic is quite similar here. So SEZs, um, particularly when they're successful, they're there. So that these little islands of economic activity, but they can be right next door to rather abject uh, poverty and difficult circumstances. And this was the first time uh, that people were talking about SEZs uh, really in terms of developing them jointly um, in a coordinated manner together with urban development policies and creating sustainable um, more, more linked SEZs. Now, other than that, this, this connectivity, coordination, policy coordination between different areas, um, the session also had some really familiar themes. Um, it was basically about linkages. Uh, we've normally talked about linkages in terms of uh, a foreign investor manufacturer who links with suppliers in the host country, but this was about local linkages. This was really about the geographically constrained area of the SEZ forming linkages into the local com community. But the same issues come up as in the other discussion. This has to be a deliberate activity. This has to be something that's really carried out as a, as a policy goal. Um, even when we know that it creates good outcomes, it won't materialize on its own. Um, and it's not spillovers. It's not something that, that just sort of happens. So you put an SEZ there, just like when you put a foreign investor there, it doesn't really improve the lives of, of the other firms or the people living around it that much. It has to be a deliberate effort. It has to be part of a policy that the SEZ develops with the plan to develop with the urban environment that it's located in. And of course, most of these are located in urban environments because that's where the connectivity is both digital and physical. So it's understandable that this links particularly to, to urban transformation. So that was my first um, takeaway from today. Then I was at uh, another session, uh, which was on uh, SEZs in Africa. And this was very interesting because they have published, a, or, or rather today, unveiled a new handbook uh, that uh, UNCTAD has done together with the German uh, Institute of Development. Uh, and there they had looked at case studies uh, of SEZs in Africa, but overall with the goal of saying really what kinds of policies appear to be working, what kinds of policies are not working, how do we develop the SEZs into an instrument that gives better outcomes. And in Africa, this appears to be a very uh, topical issue because they are, uh, Africa has lagged behind the rest of the world, so there's lots of SEZs in, in Asia, but Africa has lagged behind, but now uh, with the African Regional Trade Agreement uh, in place, now there's a great uh, push to create more SEZs and to make these more regional SEZs. And that's one of the challenges that the original setup of the SEZ is still within this kind of nation container um, or the, the very local container. Uh, it's meant to basically generate exports for a country rather than be this tool for development on a regional basis if you have an economically integrated area. So I thought this was a, a, a very interesting thing as well. And I, I will try to get my, my hands on the, on the handbook uh, then later on. The final session on SEZs um, was really about industrial parks. So I didn't even think that it was about SEZs. Uh, but even there, um, there was a representative from India uh, who was saying we need a transformation of the SEZs uh, into SIZs, in other words, uh, innovation zones. Uh, and here is this kind of life cycle idea that the more advanced um, emerging markets, developing countries uh, do not anymore want the kind of traditional manufacturing export driven, you know, uh, SEZ model, but need to really look at how do you use these kinds of islands um, development tools to really get higher value added activities and, and also some digital economy um, activities. So that was very interesting for me. And that was the, the SEZ side of the day. Uh, then in between, I just want to mention because I found it also very interesting um, from a research uh, and academic point of view, I attended uh, a session on outward investment, um, and again, something new unveiled. UNSCAP, so the Asia Pacific um, Regional uh, Unit of the UN, has developed a toolkit for home country policies for uh, outward, outward investment. 
And that toolkit is available on the internet. And it's very interesting because if I'm allowed a little sort of journey back in time, uh, then when John Dunning wrote his uh, seminal opus in 1993, he already had this structure there where you had the home country effects and the host country effects and kind of a systematic way of saying, you know, there are certain sets of effects that you, you expect in both directions. And when we then came to work on it again, I think we enhanced that and, and the basic framework was there. What's fantastic is that now this toolkit takes this to a whole new level, takes it to a very concrete and practical level where they basically have kind of the same structure uh, of the basic building blocks. But then of course there's more literature. So they are bringing in literature and everything works on the website. So you go sort of from one category of issues, let's say employment effects, and you click on that. And then you see they're actually colored sections. There are red ones, green ones, trying to very briefly summarize what the literature today says about this issue. So are the employment effects in the home country complementary or substitution effects? Uh, should you expect? Um, now, obviously that requires some simplification. You have to put things in boxes and you know it doesn't answer very nuanced questions, but the tool itself I think is fantastic from the point of view of how do we translate decades of research into something that could be a useful tool. Yes, there's some development that could be done with it and it's not the final word, but it's the first of its kind where I see that someone is really trying to kind of do a traffic light system uh, on a fairly complex set of issues, but, but doing it by sort of classifying these things and kind of going group by group. So I thought that just has all kinds of potential um, not only that specific tool, but the idea that, that this is something that we could, could in fact produce. This is not a journal article, but this is a different kind of an, an outcome. Okay, uh, then if I'm allowed then onto my, my final topic, which is uh, on the infrastructure investment. Um, I attended two sessions, one on green bonds, which is not only about infrastructure, it's about any kind of ESG um, financing. And then I attended the infrastructure investment uh, session. Now on green bonds, um, I think again, the issues are quite familiar. So to people who have been following the development of ESG reporting, uh, it's about standardization of instruments. It's about transparency. It's about verifiability. Uh, the system doesn't work unless there's a way to quantify and verify the claims that people are making. Uh, because the whole idea with the green bonds is that to issue a green bond, you need assurance that the, the object of the investment, what the money is being used for, is then indeed advancing either a climate goal under national commitments, or so it's linked to the Paris agenda, for instance, or it's linked to the SDGs, depending on the lender and what, what they consider to be appropriate. I think this is a huge field, um, or it's clearly a huge field of research uh, that needs to be done here by accountants, by, by other people. The European Union is doing its own, own part there by issuing this taxonomy, uh, which they have to do because they are now saying that financing is conditional on activities finding themselves on the right side of this taxonomy. So in order to give away a good amount of public money, well, give away, but you know, uh, they need a way to figure out which projects are deserving and which ones are not. Which brings me to infrastructure. Now, Lorraine is, of course, entirely right that, that on one hand, when we look at the global economy, it, it doesn't look that bright. We went from one and a half trillion, I mean, two trillion at the, at the high point of foreign investment in a year, and we're now at one trillion. This is really not something you can ignore. And the points that Lorraine made earlier about tax being kind of the the base for us building back anything, building back better um, is, is obviously well taken. But I have to say that on the green uh, energy side in particular, which is what I've been sort of busy with in the, in the last year or two, I find that the mood overall is much more optimistic. And let me just give you a couple of numbers. Um, so uh, there is supposedly, and, and I'm sorry, I forgot who gave these numbers, but a very credible source uh, from earlier this morning. Uh, 3.2 trillion uh, in infrastructure investment made by the G, uh, committed to by the G20, accounting for something like 3% uh, of the G20 GDP. This money, the, the staggering 
thing is that this 90% is to be spent within the next two years, uh, roughly speaking. So they've tried to put together all these commitments and 90% infrastructure investment to be spent of this 3.2 trillion. Now, this is an enormous amount of money that is coming into the system specifically uh, to build infrastructure. It would be a 45% annual increase in infrastructure investment. Um, what is, so it, it's encouraging that the money is there. Uh, there is the public money, the seed money, there is uh, also private money. Then we get into the little bit the weed, a uh, little bit in the weeds, but, but I think to the essence of the thing. So there was a, a, a man representative from ACWA, which is a, um, an energy company that, that just went public. Uh, extremely uh, interesting talk on, on the, the sort of issues that they face in the host countries. The issues they face in the host countries are again familiar to us. Um, it's really counterparty risk. It's the risk that uh, particularly in developing countries Firms, uh, there's two things. It takes too long uh, for these projects to really get approval and for the governments to really decide and to commit and, and make everything credible. So the private money just moves someplace else. And the second part is that there are real problems in counterparty risk in the sense that governments may not realize how important it is that they make credible commitments uh, about these projects really paying off uh, during the whole lifetime of the project. And here's, of course, the particularity of infrastructure that it sort of pays back over a long period of time. So these problems are exacerbated. But the situation overall is that there is a lot more money uh, than there are projects that can be financed. And this appears to be the bottleneck to, to bring projects to the stage where the, the green money, the green bonds and, and you know, regional development banks and, and who, who else is there and the private investors would be ready to commit to a long-term infrastructure investment. And one thing that I learned today that I thought was very interesting was that um, um, a person from the European Bank for, for Reconstruction um, talked about the importance of the pilot project. So we often talk about the pipeline of bankable projects, but she talked about the pilot project. In other words, you know, we know that when there's one big investor, it tends to attract, has a signaling um, effect and it, it attracts other investors. One successful pilot project, whether it's building a bridge or it's building a, an offshore wind park or, or whatever it is, would be enough to prove to the other investors that the bankability is, probably there um, and they can move ahead in that market. And I think these are issues that are just so important and they are really on a timeline that we haven't seen before um, because there is this temporal dimension. We are all, Lorraine mentioned, of course, the COVID, which has broken our uh, um, global value, value chains temporarily, the, just the comb combination of all these supply and demand shocks. But the other thing we have is this huge temporal pressure where everyone is now investing in the energy transition. Everyone who has money, so in the developed world, is putting public money there. So there we have this three trillion waiting to be invested. And I think I'm not alone in, in having the concern that I'm not sure we have enough capacity to actually make these investments simultaneously so, you know, we're not talking over 20 years, we are talking, you know, next two, three, four, five years. That's one issue. Uh, so if I want to look at it sort of negatively, I would say we have money, but that will not build a, a wind park. Do we have enough investors who are willing to take risks? And do we have the instruments that are needed to reduce some of those risks so that we can get the investments off the ground? And this means also really kind of old things like currency risk. So this is apparently one of the big things that destroys some of these investment projects, good old currency risk. So what is the solution? Well, the solution would be to arrange the lending in the host country currency, but this requires a lot of sophistication in the financial markets of the host countries, or it requires a lot of capacity building. And this is, for instance, what the European bank was doing. They were doing a lot of training like Ankhtad does. 
And she said they really pick high potential individuals from the, the ministries and they train them and they make sure that they are then their counterparts in the market where they're going in so that they can get that pilot project off the ground and then the private investors can see, okay, they, they've gotten this thing right. But at the end of the day, it, it wasn't really about things that we've never heard about before. These are the things that all investors are looking for. It's just that in the infrastructure area, it's a long commitment period. Uh, it's a long pay, payback period. It's a huge amount of investment at, the, at one time. Um, and, and then, of course, the risks and, and uncertainties. It's going into uh, all different parts of the world. So risks and uncertainties are, are high. But I find it both exhilarating, uh, the fact that this is going on. And at the same time, I feel like, you know, there are so many issues there um, where not only IB people, I mean, you know, there, there's jobs to do for finance and there's jobs to do for, for other people as well. Um, my, my final word. So I find the piloting is an important thing. I think leapfrogging is another big thing. So if you look at a country like India, India is now committing to going from 100 gigawatts of renewable uh, capacity to 450 uh, by 2030. That would make it the, I think the fourth, um, it is now the fourth or the fifth uh, largest um, renewables uh, producer in the world. In other words, of their installed capacity, they are number four and five in solar and wind. So they are already a big player, but they need to quadruple the investment annually to meet this goal. Uh, and that's already a lot. They're getting 10 gigawatts a year. They need 40 to get to uh, 450. But on the other hand, think about India. I mean, by 2050, India is going to be the most populous country in the world. It's going to be the largest urban economy in the world its energy usage could easily quadruple. So if they get it right or they get it wrong is a huge difference. Uh, and at the moment, India is really a hot market for, uh, for wind and solar, where of course the story is much simpler because these are cost effective. They are the cheapest way to produce new energy. And that's why I think the, the leapfrogging issue is important for developing countries because if and when they are developing new capacity that is meeting new demand for energy, there is absolutely no impediment to them building huge solar, huge wind. Um, they also have some assets that are recent, that are coal and, and things like that. They can't afford to get rid of them. We have to deal with that. That's a transition period. But for emerging markets, this is another leapfrogging um, opportunity. Um, and for developed markets, I think there is also a little bit of a piloting uh, thing going on with hydrogen, which is um, requires still more experimentation and investment. Uh, but that's what we're doing in Scandinavia, for instance. Uh, and I think this will also link with the efforts in the emerging markets to, to build the electricity capacity. And if we can get hydrogen right, then that can also be diffused into the emerging markets. So I'm optimistic on the energy side. Uh, <laughs> everything else, yes, appears to be a challenge. Good. End of that, but a great day. Uh, fascinating sessions. Thank you very much, um, uh, Sayana. So I actually got um, a, a question by email, uh, which uh, I found quite interesting. Uh, so, uh, so uh, in this um, uh, uh, conference, uh, uh, there's a lot of practitioners, a lot of academics that are attending, a lot of uh, business people. But there's also quite a few students. Uh, so uh, there are many students from the New York University at Abu Dhabi that are attending from HEC Montreal and from other places around the, the globe. So uh, if, if you would be advising uh, current students what they should be paying attention to when we're thinking about investing in sustainable development, um, what would you advise them to look at, to uh, pay attention to? You've both already answered some of this uh, in your remarks, but um, but are there one or two issues that you feel um, they sh really should uh, focus on? Maybe I'll start with you, Lorraine. I guess when you mean investing in sustainable development, you mean you're talking about PhD students looking for dissertation topics is, is, is one thing. Another is whether they really want to put their pocket in one of these issues and, and start engaging in them themselves. Uh, and, and these are hard questions to answer because I mean, we really are living in interesting times. 
you know, I listened to Sariana and thought about, you know, I saw what's going on here are huge tectonic changes in the global economy in a way we haven't seen in a while. And so to be young students, master's students or PhD students looking at these and living through these, um, it's kind of a wonderful opportunity to choose where you wanna make a difference, right? And I think then we, I guess I would say two things. One, you know, figure out where your own values and your own heart is, what really matters to you because those are things that will resonate with you in terms of studying and getting involved in them, whether it's energy or it's tax or it's gender issues, you know, where your passion is. The other thing I would say is, um, I think you really have to read broadly and read current events now. And, and um, you know, The Economist, <laughs> Financial Times, keeping up with what's going on is extraordinarily difficult these days because there's so much happening. But I think to have a good sense of it, you, you have to decide which pieces of information you trust and, and follow with those. Um, dissertation topics are so difficult. I mean, clearly listening to Sarian, I think you would suggest that maybe moving into the energy area. I'm fascinated by the digital economy, Industry 4.0. I was interested in the shift from mass production to lean production, wrote a lot of stuff on the auto industry moving to lean, and really interested. And so now I'm, I'm looking at the third one changing. I mean, how cool is that, having lived through one and now watching another happening ar around me again? Uh, I, I think, you know, these are not going to stop. And um, Sarian is right. There are huge pent up demands for investments coming and they need to be in the right places and done appropriately. And that means, you know, lots of things get in the way. Um, investors are risk averse. And, and, and these are, we are talking about, I was thinking, especially Sarian, thinking about the building of the railroads in the 18, you know, 50s in the building the railroads and, and how you needed public investment together with private to make those huge investments, investments happen. And, um, you know, maybe we're witnessing a similar sort of transition into digital globalization, right? And, and somehow both governments and the general public and investors and firms have to all work together uh, towards this. Um, but somehow, frankly, we've got to get the ozone layer <laughs> protected or we'll all be gone due to global warming, frankly. It's, you know, the, at the bottom line, at the end of the day, we have to do something about the environment such that we can live here and not have to live underground. So, Sariana, over to you. Yeah, so of course, uh, you know, you could guess that I would offer any any topics in the area of the of the energy transition, uh, but I could just as well say it's the digital transformation. I mean, I think it's equally profound. Uh, it just manifests itself in in different ways. But if I focus on the energy, I mean, even there, there are so many different things you can do. So I mentioned that there are huge things in accounting. I think accounting is really going to be <laughs> quite important. Uh, uh, in order to really develop the metrics that we need to, to measure uh, uh, green investment, to, to really track sustainability performance. Uh, yes, there will be some unresolved issues there. Uh, I think the closer we get to consumer markets, the less worried I am about it, because I think firms will make their own decisions about what their customers want and, and what sustainability is for them. But I'm more on the side of, you know, the environmental side, the, the energy side, these are concrete things where I don't think that it's really uh, up to debate uh, what really needs to be done. And there are so many issues there. So just to give you a couple of examples. So if you want to study uh, really the government uh, firm interaction and how that is needing to be reshaped, then look to Scandinavia, look, look to these companies that are doing the hydrogen uh, experimentation. I find it totally fascinating. And like Lorraine said, it is like the, the, the railways, but with more pressure, uh, with, with the time pressure that you, know, you basically need to be done in 10 years. Um, on the other hand, I, I think there's so much to look at. Uh, 
in terms of, of wind and solar. So these are technologies that have proven themselves. They are cost competitive, but there are still issues about how we get investment into emerging markets, as I was, I was just talking about. And that's capacity building. And who's going to do that capacity building? I think we need people trained in to understand M&E business models, to understand the realities, the strategies of these firms who then go and work for the government, who then go and work for the, the regional uh, development banks so that we have people who can do, give the policy advice, who can go and really lead these efforts at capacity building. Um, it, it will not come out of nowhere. And I think the journal is, is one uh, part of that. I hope that we can also create educational programs that, but th these two are linked. I mean, if we're talking about PhDs, there have to be places for these PhDs to publish. I mean, otherwise th this is a, a non-starter. So I think we need to, to re reorientate, and we are already, um, to address those three things that, that Lorraine mentioned at the beginning. It's digital, it's ESGs, and it's the political economy of the global economy today in all its manifestations. Um, it's, it's dealing with uh, protectionism or nationalism, but it's also dealing with huge multilateral public policy push, uh, like the SDGs, but even more like the, the, the climate agenda. Um, I think these are things, all individual topics that we need to keep on the agenda and that have so, so much uh, to give and, and so useful in their application to, uh, to society. Incidentally, not only, I mean, I tend to think from the, the sort of public policy side, but I think equally useful for multinationals um, who need to, to understand what kind of a policy driven world uh, they, they actually live in. Uh, because I, I could not have imagined this 10 years ago. Uh, when, when I wrote my dissertation on environmental issues, you know, th this was a minority interest. This was really, not something that I would have thought. And some of these things, you know, in Europe now, we are probably going to have a border adjustment. So, so green tariffs of some sort or another. Um, unheard of, you know, you could not have proposed that 10 years ago, 20 years ago. People would have said, no, that just, that invites a, no one can calculate those properly and anybody that invites a trade war and it's, it's a non-starter. We don't intervene uh, with those instruments. Um, so different world. I have one follow-up comment. If I was telling students where to invest their time and their energy, right, other than dissertation topics, whatever, but in general, undergraduate students as well as graduate, two years ago, the maybe it was three now, the AIB meetings were in Copenhagen. And I got invited to spend the day at Oikos, O-I-K-O-S. Some of you may know it. It's mostly a European group of students, primarily in economics departments and business schools that are interested in the sustainable development goals, really focusing on sustainability. I was amazed at the energy in the room. Spent the day, or two of us actually spent the day with them and looking at projects and evaluating projects. It's all over the world. I would tell any young people watching today, look up OIKOS on the internet, O-I-K-O-S, and if your university doesn't have a chapter, get one and get involved. Thank you very much for the, these uh, uh, great uh, comments. So there's another question I'm getting here on the, uh, the chat, just a second here. It's a bit longer. Um, so this is from, from a, a Thailand Chi. So a recent report indicates that China is reaching a tipping point where the cost Oh, so, so this is a more a comment that he's giving. Um, uh, let me just. So he's he's um, so he's indicating that there's a tipping point where the cost of solar energy is about the same as or lower than the cost of coal. This evidently has much to do with the investment incentives provided by the Chinese government, in addition uh, to its large domestic market, and some of the incentives probably would violate WTO rules on subsidies. In the meantime, the US government is very concerned about Chinese government incentives for renewable energy turning uh, China into a leader in the field and characterizes it as unfair trade practices. So here's a question. How might the World Trade Organization revise its rules on trade practices that can promote sustainability while maintaining fairness in trade? And I think actually 
this relates to what Sariana, you were pointing out. How can Europe put a uh, carbon adjustment tax without violating uh, these issues of um, uh, fairness in trade? So, so I think this is a, a very important question uh, that uh, a lot of people around the globe are, are asking right now. So do you have any comments on that? So very briefly, there's a lot in that question. Um, of course, we've always had the exceptions for health and safety and things like that. that that's been uh, part of the um, part of the GATT agreement already. So that was, you know, back in the day um, when I was doing my my dissertation, that that was already some of these exceptions were allowed. Um, on the issue of just the cost competitiveness of solar and wind. It is my understanding that they are the the state of the technology now is that it is the cheapest form. Uh, obviously, it depends a little bit on the country whether it's solar or wind uh, that works better. But um, these are the cheapest forms of new capacity that that you can build for electricity. When we go back to if we say I don't know the Chinese solar industry so well, I know the wind industry case uh, fairly well, and that was clearly a case where China was stretching. Uh, what you could do within the rules. In other words, they withdrew some of the measures, but only once they had had enough time to actually do what they needed to do. Uh, I don't think it's the first time that that a country has ever done that. But yes, there was some some stretching of the rules. So at the moment, I'm not sure uh, that there really is grounds um, for that kind of. Then overall, so so the other separate issue there is subsidies by Chinese government to. Uh, Chinese industry. Th that's a whole other discussion. I think there there are issues uh, on on both sides, and there clearly I think is an issue about subsidies on the Chinese side. But specifically with with respect to to solar, I don't think it's about the viability of those investments. It it may be about the past history, how they got to a very prominent uh, position. But I would also add to this a little bit of the story of India. I mean, you know, I could have also um, talked about China. Um, it, it makes a huge difference whether China is, um, I mean, China is the, the, the second largest CO2 emitter. Um, in 10 years, it'll be China and India. So it matters a huge deal whether their industry is competitive and it's a difficult thing to, to, to answer because there is a greater good, which is that they have actually driven down the prices, I think largely due to the huge demand in the Chinese market uh, to the level where it is now a cost competitive. Um, um, but, but to some of the incumbents in the industry, yes, I could see the unfairness argument. So private public interest, mm, clear conflict. Well, I'll add just a little bit on this too, although I'm not the expert that Sariana is in the cases. Um, under the WTO, there are a list of unfair trade practices. Uh, dumping is one of them. Export subsidies are another. Not subsidies to your domestic industry, but subsidies that are specifically aimed at export are a form of non-tariff barrier. And any country can say that products are being dumped in that were very artificially subsidized, the exports in were artificially subsidized. And if the country finds that's the case, it can retaliate with some kind of a tariff on the other side of equivalent matching and is often in something quite different, right? As, uh, as we know here, at the end of the day, that often gets settled at the WTO in court. The problem is the United States hasn't approved judges. So in effect, the WTO is hamstrung by the um, failure to be an effective forum for settling these kinds of disputes. The issue of whether what China is doing is a domestic subsidy to his own firms or it's a formal export subsidy, which is illegal under the GATT, needs to be hammered out in international court. Uh, so my sort of solution here, frankly, Talon, would be that the WTO needs to get revitalized, which means the U.S. has got to get involved again and start uh, putting money in and, and promoting getting some things. I actually think there's a many things that are being handled in other forum that would be better handled at the WTO if it were revitalized. For example, and I'll, I'll, one of my big example is digital sales and services taxes, right? 
The proliferation of these, which has led to pillar one amount A, uh, is a poor response to this. Um, digital services taxes uh, belong in the gaps, the general agreement on trade and services, and they should be handled at the gaps. But the gaps is you know, stuck in limbo these days because the WTO has been so eviscerated. Um, I'm for a new, I'm for countries committing to the WTO and plowing more money in and revitalizing the court system and then rethinking about how the digital economy could be folded into the gaps and into the trip rules. I mean, we had a really very strong international trade system that managed these disputes, I think, very well. And then um, it created and handled free trade agreements very well and customs unions. And it really did attempt to manage the transition of developing countries out of the exceptions in part four of the GATT into becoming regular countries like China, regular members, and then having to give up some of the special treatment they had under part four. It's to me very sad that the WTO has so little power these days in this system and, and one would hope that it could be revitalized to handle these energy issues which are going to be so prevalent in terms of whether their subsidies handle the digital digitalization of the economy and VAT taxes and so you know I'm, I'm, I need to uh, as Ari is telling me we need to uh, to wrap it up but you can see where my heart is here is that uh, as originally a trade economist I would love to see this area of policy revitalized. So yeah, I think that the border adjustment should also be something that the European Union yes. decides on. Agreed. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so um, uh, as you can see, uh, so Lorraine was indicating that when she went to uh, to Copenhagen, that she met with uh, uh, Oikos and, and, and saw the, 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 the very enthusiastic uh, uh, students. Uh, I hope that everybody appreciates that at the Academy of International Business, uh, uh, it is the same thing. Uh, the moment that we start talking about issues that come to our hearts, we like to discuss it and we like to uh, go deeper into it and uh, we can we can be busy for another hour more uh, looking at all these different issues. Uh, uh, so um, I think this is great because we are living in turbulent times where there is a push to do things more nationally, but actually what we need is more international engagement. Uh, it is great that UNCTAD is uh, certainly trying to promote this. The World Investment Forum is a great place where these discussions are taking place. Uh, so um, we're going to uh, finish the daily roundup today, but uh, tomorrow there will be another one. Um, uh, so tomorrow there will be a daily roundup with me and with Rob Gross. Uh, uh, Rob Gross is, uh, of course, another uh, very uh, enthusiastic speaker um, uh, uh, and knowledgeable speaker about issues related to uh, international business. So uh, I would uh, recommend all of you to come and join us. There's also some very interesting panels going on tomorrow. Um, there is the uh, closing academic uh, uh, session uh, where I believe um, uh, Sariana and Lorraine both are on. Um, and uh, so it's not Lorraine, but Sariana is going to be on that. Uh, uh, there will also be a uh, AIB panel on um, uh, developing future-proof uh, global value chains. Uh, uh, so, uh, so we're looking forward to seeing there in big numbers, uh, but we will be signing off for today. Have a great evening and we'll see you tomorrow.